good morning, everybody. I'd like to say welcome to the 2019 Spring Behavioral Health Virtual Conference. This is our first virtual conference. We'll have another one towards the end of this year. I hope you all really enjoy the day. We have some great speakers, lots of wisdom, lots of knowledge. I'd like to say thank you to all of them for all the hard work that they are doing. I'm sure that this week is crazy for everybody. For a lot of us, this is the first week back from spring break. Um, for myself, my children had two weeks of spring break, so my mind is pretty scrambled at this point. I just wanted to show you all the the, uh, the schedule for today. Again, if you want to receive um, CEU credits for, for your time that you participate today, per the CEU protocol that we have for our monthly calls, you have to participate for a minimum of 45 minutes combined. Um, each one of our speakers is speaking in 30-minute intervals. We will take a break uh, this morning from 1045 until 11 a.m. We will then have lunch from 1130 to 1230, and then, and I apologize, that says a.m. It should say p.m., and then we will take another break again at 1.30 to 1.45, concluding by 2.30. We will work promptly because each one of our speakers is very busy like you all. If you need to step out and step back in, that's fine. Just make sure that when you come back onto the line, you do not need to announce yourself. So when WebEx says, please uh, say your name after the beep, you don't have to say anything because Otherwise, we hear that in the middle of a presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you can speak to me through the WebEx chat function. So if you look at the top of your screen right now, it says chat with participants. Um, you can pull my name, Brittany Couch, and send a direct message to me. That way, if you are not on the WebEx chat function, you can email me. So per the CEU protocol, in order to receive CEUs if you need that, you need to ensure that you log in to WebEx on your individual computer, use your first and last name, and that's how I take the enrollment and I check it against uh, the enrollment with the Training Institute's link. We had a few participants this morning that had an issue with their Zenegrade account. Um, the, uh, it was showing as registration was closed. It's been marked as open again, so you can still go on and register right now if you need those or want the CEU credits. Um, if for some reason it's still saying it's closed, try clearing your, what they say, your internet cookies. It might be that your web browser history is kind of wonky. Also, in terms of running um, WebEx and um, signing up through Zenegrade, it might be helpful to not use Internet Explorer. That tends to have more bugs, so use Chrome, Google, or Firefox, and if for some reason you're still having problems with the registration through um, the HRD training link, then you can actually call the Training Institute, and they should be able to register you manually. But I please ask you to, just because they're busy today, to do everything um, possible to register yourself. In terms of the schedule, we have Nancy Falcon as our keynote. Then that will be followed up by Clifford Sipes talking about new communication skills and strategies, um, working with young people. Then a conversation with um, our very own Jerry Mullendor talking about supporting the families at home to learn new techniques. Then Benji Rendon, um, who is, will be discussing teaching youth new coping skills and strategies. After lunch, we will have Stacy Williams from Creoaks, um, who will be discussing teaching youth new problem-solving skills, followed by Julie Geddes, teaching youth new social skills and strategies, tools to use with education partners and parents, as well as Kristen Perez-Rickles uh, from Oklahoma Department of Education, who will also share some tools. Uh, that is our conference schedule for today. If you need to walk away from your, um, from your phone, just make sure all lines will, we want you all to stay muted. If you have to log off, or I'm excuse me, if you have to step away, Please hang up. Do not press on, put us on mute because we will hear your agency's hold music, and I won't be able to, to stop that. So even if we have everybody to drop the call and come back, we will steer, still hear your agency's hold music. So if you need to step away, either just press mute or hang up the phone, and we will be here when you return. So without further ado, we are going to have – Nancy Falcon, she's another one of our state coaches and trainers. My dear friend, I love her very much. 
Her presentation is called Sinbad, Super Nanny, Caesar Milan, and the Behavioral Health Aid. Take it away, Nancy. Thank you, Brittany. Okay, so I have several uh, video clips as part of this presentation. And I'm hoping that we will be able to hear them. If not, uh, Brittany has this PowerPoint, and all the links are in the slides, so you will be able to look them up later if you have trouble hearing them. Okay. Now this one? Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is one. Okay, make sure that's up. Okay. It's one of my favorite movies, and as somebody told me, it's an old movie, which means I'm old. And if you're on the phone, you know who you were. And we're just going to take a look at a trailer for this movie. I think this movie is the best BHA training you guys can have. I'm going to give you homework over the weekend. Go watch it. A little background on that, but he's guarding the president's son. The kid is a total wreck, um, gets in trouble all the time. But the character that Sinbad plays figures out that this is a kid. He's being bullied at school. He doesn't have any friends. And so he takes it upon himself to teach him some skills like dancing and boxing in order to help him make friends and feel like, um, like he has some – power in his life. So I'm going to show you the next one. A little montage of what they do together. You got chat. Sorry about the ads. I'm too cheap to pay for the no ad thing.
I'm going to remind everybody as you're joining us, please mute your phone so that we don't hear the noise going on from your um, from your background. Okay, so <laughs> sorry, we're messing with YouTube. Um, so what I want to point out about that video is, first of all, he's teaching a skill, and then he's supporting and encouraging while the young man practices that skill. And as he masters a level of that skill, he increases the difficulty until um, he's mastered the entire skill. So I really like that. Um, did you do that? Uh, I really like that that is a good, a good example of what a BHA does. You're, you're teaching skills, and then you're helping them encourage practicing them, and then helping them master those new skills. Yeah. So, hang on, let me come over here. So when we're talking about behavioral health aids, we need to make sure that we understand that the, the behavioral health aids work is intensive. Notice that um, Ben Bad's character is taking this kid to the gym after he's off his own ship. So he's really spending a lot of time with this young man in order to do the best kind of work that he can. Very intensive job. It's intentional. He's thought about how to help this young man increase his own self-efficacy, how to help him be able to defend himself from the bullies. And um, you didn't see it, but he also teaches him how to dance so that he can go to social events and interact without feeling self-conscious. He sat down and he thought about, how can I help this young man make friends? It's also intermittent. Behavioral health aids are not intended to be having a caseload, caseload and seeing, you know, a, a certain group of kids on a regular basis or an indeterminate amount of time. A behavioral health aid is, I like to describe it as the phlebotomist in your doctor's office. The phlebotomist comes in, they wrap the piece of rubber around your arm, they look for a good vein, they stick you, they switch vials a few times, um, they slap a bandage on it, and then they walk away, hopefully without too much vomit on their shoes. And, yes, that's a personal story. <laughs> a BHA comes in, figures out what's happening, has a discussion about what to do about it, and then implements the plan. And once the plan's been implemented and revised a few times to make sure that we're getting the results we want, then they're out hopefully without too much vomit on their shoes. And then it's individualized. BHA work cannot be the same with every youth that you're working with. It has to be individualized to that young person. And then I'm just going to remind you about the four uh, strategies that BHAs use, helping youth develop alternative behaviors, new coping skills, uh, increase their social connections, and develop wellness and self-care skills. So let's look at Super Nanny. What was healthy and badly. And my mother had Hagen picked up by her grandparents. I'm going to the granny. Hagen, come in here. I'm not going to the He didn't want to go. He thought he was missing out on something. And he started to have a temper tantrum. And I was waiting to gently to give him a warning. Come here. Get inside. But no, it didn't happen. And I had to step in. And this is a warning. Hagen, you come inside the house right now, otherwise you'll be on the spot. Hagen ran in, but then he ran straight back out again. But this is a you exactly what to do, and she put him straight on that naughty spot. <laughs> come on, you run on the spot. Sit right there. Come on, me. He's on the spot right now. No, don't talk to him. When the hell arrived, it was so important that he didn't interfere with discipline. Because Jensi needs to do this all on her own. And she can't be overruled by a grandfather all the time. 
it right there. He started running outside, and I had to chase him. Horrible. I'm so quick. She got to me. It's really tough to sit back. I was tempted to uh, go after Hagen, but I knew that I should let Jensen do that. You're in control, right? Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Finally, after almost an hour, Hagen realized he wasn't going to win this one. You're not being confrontational. You're in control. You're composed. And you're still. Who's in control? Me. It felt great to follow through. Because he finally did sit on the spot. And it made me feel like, hey, <laughs> I got power. Look at me. I placed you in the naughty spot because you ran away from me. I want an apology. I'm sorry. Give me a hug and kiss. He gave her a kiss, told her he loved her. And I was absolutely shocked. This was the first time that Gentsy has ever stepped up and disciplined by herself. And I was so glad that Hell saw that. So now he can go back and tell Carolyn that they don't have to do it anymore because she can do it by herself. Okay, well, Brittany's trying to pull the chat function over to the second screen. So what I saw in this Super Nanny clip was she was teaching, modeling for the adult how to do a different interaction with the youth and then encouraging and supporting the adult as they made changes. Sometimes BHAs are working with the adults on how they react to and how they interact with the young person. It's not always just BHA and child. Yeah. You can tell them to turn off their camera, just click it off, I think. Okay. I need to advance the screen over. Okay. So I have a grandma story. Some of you have heard it and some of you haven't. <laughs> Whatever you need to say. Um, the best BHA I've ever seen in action was my own grandmother. Um, my cousin Carl and I are two years apart. He thinks he knows everything, even as an adult. Um, and he used to drive me crazy because, you know, people who think they know everything really drive those of us who actually do know everything up a wall. And I had had enough of it with him one day, and I slammed my grandmother's front door as I was stormed off into the front yard. And she came out in the front yard and she said, Nancy Ann Sorrel, you know you're in trouble when the middle name comes out, right? You get over here right now. And then she proceeded to instruct me step by excruciating step on how to properly shut the door like the young lady that I was intended to be. And it seemed like it was an hour. I don't know that it was. But it seemed like for the next hour she stood there and had me open the door and then close the door properly, all while Sarah was sitting on the couch mocking me. The point of that is I never slammed my grandmother's door again. I slammed other doors in other places, but never my grandmother's house. A BHA takes the time and their consistent and insistent and their focus on the outcome. It's about sustainability. Like I said, I never slammed the door at my grandmother's house again because she was consistent, insistent, and focused on the outcome. And, yes, that's a picture of me with, uh, you know, I don't know, stretchy arms. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. So bring this back over. And... So disclaimer before I show the next two clips, I'm not saying that children are dogs, but I am saying that children and dogs have a lot in common. But you love turkey. Sorry about these ads. Call, chat, or email Siwi.com today and save 30% on your first. One of the first and 
unwanted behavior that you'll experience with your puppy is jumping. I'm here with one of Caesar's head trainers, Todd Langston, to give us insight on the behavior. What triggers a puppy to start jumping? That's a good question. Uh, jumping is, is a somewhat of a natural behavior at the beginning. Uh, a dog is very attracted to scent, and the strongest part of our scent comes from our genital area and our mouth. So initially, a dog might start climbing up your leg or crawling up your leg to see if they can't get closer to those spots to have a sniff. If you give a dog attention in the form of eye contact, touch, or your voice, you are basically telling them that you approve of the behavior, you agree with the behavior, and therefore the behavior will continue to happen. So the first thing that I typically want people to do is to completely ignore jumping. No touch, no talk, no eye contact. Just by ignoring one behavior and giving affection to this one here, what I'm encouraging the dog to do is to practice a more desirable behavior, such as sitting or laying down. So what if ignoring the dog's behavior doesn't work? Have that puppy drag a leash around. Anytime that puppy jumps on you, take the leash and give it a little snap to the side so that you're now using discipline. We want to wait now for the dog to go into a calm state. What should we not do when the puppy starts jumping? You don't want to make eye contact, and you don't want to talk to the puppy. And the reason for that is, is that becomes attention to the dog, and that's ultimately what they're trying to get. So a lot of people back up and try to push the dog off of them in this fashion when the dog jumps. And the touch becomes attention, and the backing up is the dog's space. And with puppies, they're always trying to learn where they fit in with you in the pack. And if you give them space when they jump, you have an essence submitted to them. Stepping forward can oftentimes be a little added energy that makes the dog realize you find this behavior inappropriate and that you disagree with it. What if the puppy is jumping on someone else? You can work on a sick command. With your dog, it's okay if you use treats. And as you walk up to people, you simply instruct them, if he jumps, please ignore him. You walk up, you get your dog to sit. As they sit, you have people pet them. If the dog jumps, you can simply take a step back, bring the dog away from the human, get the situation calm, and bring the dog back in. You only get affection for doing something calm or behavior that we find acceptable. We can't deny that a puppy jumping on us is adorable. We have to remember that the puppy can quickly grow from 10 pounds to 50 or more. It's better to prevent this behavior now and avoid dangerous situations in the future. I know it may seem hard to understand how a dog jumping can be considered dangerous, but believe it or not, more people are injured by dogs knocking them over through jumping than through biting them. So as an owner, getting control of this now at an early age is going to prevent that from potentially happening to you guys in the future. Okay, a couple of things that I want to point out from this. Hang on a minute. Okay. I'm going to get straight to the next one. Um, first of all, jumping is a natural behavior. The kids that we work with, a lot of the problem behaviors are really natural and, and perfectly normal behaviors in the correct setting. It's usually the setting that's the problem. The other thing I want to point out is that dogs have a reason for jumping. I don't know if you caught it, but they're trying to smell people. Kids have a reason for the things that they do. There's always a reason for a behavior. Part of the behavioral health aid's role is to help figure out and help the other adults understand the reason. The other thing that I want to point out from this video is that Behaviors that get rewarded with affection in the dog's case or attention in a child's case, those are reinforced. That means it's more likely that it's going to happen again. In order to discourage unwanted behaviors from happening again, we have to not reinforce it. And Caesar's suggestion, or I can't remember the guy's name, the suggestion was to ignore the behavior. And sometimes that's the best thing to do, is to ignore the behavior. Um, we're going to watch another video about dogs. And again, I'm not saying kids are like dogs, but they are like dogs. Oh, he's mad. Oh, he's cute. Okay. Okay. Oh, my Easily one of the most annoying behaviors of having a new dog is nipping and chewing. I'm here as one of Caesar's Way's head trainer, Todd Langton, to show us how we can nip this annoying behavior in the bud. How do we prevent chewing or nipping? 
that might be the two behaviors that dog owners end up being the most frustrated with of all. Let's start with nipping. Nipping is basically a natural instinctive behavior for a dog because when they're young, they explore the world with their mouth. They pick things up, they feel the texture of it, they get the smell of it, the taste of it, and that's natural behavior for them. If a puppy walks up to another puppy and nips it too hard in play or just in any interaction, the puppy that got nipped is going to yelp. And what that sound does is it communicates to this one here that that wasn't okay. You can do the same thing. You can actually make a yelping sound. Like, hey! You wait for the puppy to calm back down, and you go back in, and you interact with them again. If a puppy gets too nippy, and they come in, and during interacting with you, they start to nip or they start to grab you, what you'll do is you redirect them. You can redirect them with a toy, or you can redirect them with a piece of food. In this case, I'm using bacon. Bacon's one of the best things you can use because it's such a powerful smell. What can people do with puppies that are chewing furniture? For starters, it's very important to make sure that your puppy is fulfilled on a daily basis. The majority of chewing comes from boredom. So if you occupy your puppy, give him plenty of exercise, lots of stimulation, plenty of chew toys, that can often curb the chewing. Now, there's also products that are available that can also help you out. Bitter apple spray. You spray a little bit on a cotton ball or a little piece of um, paper towel or tissue. You take that cotton ball and you put it in their mouth. The reaction of most dogs is going to be to spit it out. The smell is connected to the, yeah, the bitterness and that negative taste. So in essence, what it does is it creates an avoidance of the smell. From that point, you take the spray and you spray it in the area that they're chewing. And you do that every day for anywhere between two and four weeks. And what that's going to do is it's going to start to teach the puppy that there's a, a negative outcome to chewing on that. And I think the most important thing to remember here is every single time you interact with your dog, every single time, it's a learning moment and a teaching moment. They're learning, we're teaching. Do you have any recommendations for puppies that are nipping children? I do. It's what I call be a treat. So puppy starts to nip at them, I want the kids to jump up and simply stop moving. And this way the puppy learns that there's rules in regards to the children and there's limits to the way they can interact with us. And I find that very important because nipping puts dogs in the shelter possibly more than most of the other behaviors. Nipping it in the bud, as you said, is a, uh, is a perfect way to fix it. Thanks, Todd, for giving us the tools on how to address this annoying behavior. Okay, some things to point out here. Um, this kind of makes me think about kids that are being aggressive with other kids. And I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, using redirection and not or keeping kids occupied are two biggies because, like you said, most chewing comes out of boredom. And I believe a lot of in, inappropriate behavior, especially in school, comes from being bored. So if we can keep kids active and, and engaged, that kind of helps mitigate that. The second thing is, um, you know, hey, Bacon, bacon works for me. I'll do what you want me to do if you give me bacon. And then using positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement both in tandem can help a child learn what's appropriate behavior and practice appropriate behavior and understand inappropriate behavior. You can then help, help this by engaging their senses. Um, not that you want to put cotton ball with, you know, bitter flavor on it in a kid's mouth, but helping them connect inappropriate behaviors to unwanted outcomes and helping them make that connection will help them not continue to practice the unwanted behavior. So like I said, kids are a little bit like dogs. James so, Aldi. And then if you've ever been in a training with me, you know how much I love Amy and Sheldon. Where did it go? Where did I? Oh, hold on. You lost Hang on. I lost my YouTube. Did you get rid of it? No, I just missed it. There it is. Okay. 
if you've been in training with me, you know how much I love Sheldon and Amy, and I love this clip about. I might be able to help you with this. There's a whole field of behavioral neuroscience that examines ways to retrain your neural pathways so stuff like this bothers you less. If I just told you, I don't have a problem with closure. You sure about that? I'm quite sure. <laughs> I've come up with a series of exercises to help with your compulsive need for closure. I take issue with the word compulsive. All I'm saying is we live in a world where closure isn't always an option. argument, let's say I have a problem. And what would be your plan for addressing it? I'm going to recondition your brain so that the need for completion isn't so overwhelming. By playing tic-tac-toe? Yep. Your turn. Oh, Amy. And you wonder why people think neuroscience is anything but a goofy game for diaper babies. <laughs> tic-tac-toe can only end in win, lose, or draw none of which will deny me closure, especially since I'm about to win. Well, we didn't finish. Exactly. How does that make you feel? The same way any normal person would. I don't want to peel off my own face and tear it in two and then again and again to like a handful of children face confetti. And that's exactly the feeling you want to address with this course of treatment. Yeah. Or you could pitch in, grab an nostril, and help me get a face off. Come on, you can do this. Yeah, but you don't know what it's like to feel completely frustrated and to have a, a desire built up within you and then be denied any opportunity for relief. when things don't get finished. And if you notice, she sat down and she intentionally designed activities that would bring up his frustration. That's very important because sometimes when we're working with kids, we don't want to upset them. We don't want to set them off. But frankly, if their behaviors are inappropriate and unacceptable, then how are they going to practice the new skills that you're teaching them if they don't have that situation in real life. I hope that makes sense. Also, it's very important to know that she understands who Sheldon is as a person. She knows his culture. She knows his preferences and his strengths, and she plays into all of that. 
as she's designing a, an intervention to help him. Very important. Okay. So I'm not going to take the time to go through all of these, but I wanted to point out that um, there are different interventions and, inter and activities that you can do with children. Sometimes watching a video with them will spark a conversation. Sometimes if you don't have the skill, you can pull up an instructional video on YouTube. For instance, I, I don't have it on here, but there's a, a great video on learning how to juggle four balls, and it's only three minutes long. You can find all kinds of instructional videos on the Internet. Books are a great thing to do with kids. Um, here are some of the books from my collection that I actually used when I was out in the field. And the important part here is to make the connection. You have to actually explicitly make the connection for kids about the story and what's going on in their real life. Sometimes for kids that can be you prompting a question to start a conversation about it. And sometimes you have to, you know, like not really lecture, but explain why you chose this book and how it applies to their situation. There's a whole lot more books that I could have put up here. Um, I only had a certain amount of time or space on the screen. If you have other books that you use with children in this manner, I would love for you to send us a list um, so that we can like, create a, a bibliotherapy list and tell us how you've used it with children. Some activities that um, nobody really does with kids anymore. I played all this one. Uh, I was growing up, Red Light, Green Light, Mother May I, Simon Says, and then just sitting and looking at clouds. And, yes, it is a picture of a cloud formation that looked to me like it was flipping me off as I was driving down the highway. This sparks creativity. It helps children learn impulse control strategies. It helps their listening skills. And people just don't do these activities with children anymore. So this would be a, a really good thing to do with kids, especially when you've got groups that you're working with. Um, children learn as much, if not more, from their playtime as they will ever learn sitting at a desk in a classroom. So in conclusion, where did it go? There it is. Nope. Back up. Where did my YouTube go? I did it again. I'm sorry. I got one more clip for you. Okay, I'm going to skip a couple of these. What I'm trying to say is that maybe you can't approach this as a purely intellectual exercise. What do you mean? Well, remember when you tried to learn how to swim using the Internet? I did learn how to swim on the floor. The skills are transferable. I just have no interest in going in the water. Then why learn how to swim? The ice caps are melting, Leonard. In the future, swimming isn't going to be optional. So just like Leonard says, you can't learn how to swim on the Internet. You have to be in the water in order to learn how to swim. That means we have to come up with intentional activities, games, situations that are real life, everyday situations that our kiddos are going to be facing and dealing with in order to help those interactions that we're teaching them and those new skills that we're helping them build to take root. They can't swim if they're not in the water. And just like on the video with the dogs um, biting and chewing where he says, that's the number one reason that kids, that dogs get put into shelters because of biting and chewing. Those are aggressive behaviors. And we don't want our children in the future things that are getting them in trouble right now. The future needs to be better for them. It needs to be brighter for them. And as a BHA, you have a wonderful, precious opportunity to spend your time getting to know the kids that you're working with, getting to know their adults, helping develop a plan, implementing that plan, 
making adjustments to that plan, and always being focused on the outcome. It's an amazing work that you do, and I just want to say thank you to all of you out there for doing it. You are making the future of Oklahoma a better, better and brighter future. You're making Oklahoma a better place every day by what you do. And thanks. I just want to say thank you. And then the last slide is just my contact information with my, uh, what did what'd you call it? Going oh, oh, Super Saiyan. Super Saiyan? Super Saiyan. Super Saiyan. That's me going Super Saiyan. <laughs> so I hope you guys have a, rest of, uh, a great rest of the day, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over back to Brittany. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Nancy, for your presentation. Our next presenter will be Clifford. Clifford is going to take a few moments to get set up, and then we will keep moving. All right, so while Clifford is getting everything all organized, I will just give reminders. Please ignore my scary desktop. I'm going to show you all. <laughs> it is scary. Nancy's like, Brittany, it's a shame. Let me pull up the conference schedule. So we have Clifford is going to present, and then Jerry, and then we have a break at 1045. If you would like to chat with me or there's a question that you have, you can find my name in the in the chat function. You should be able to because I'm the moderator, or it might just say moderator, and you can send it directly to me. If you have to sign out and sign back in, you do not need to say your name after the, after the tone, and just make sure that you put your line on mute. Okay, Clifford? I'm going to save Clifford's information to the drive right now, so we will have that. All right, Clifford. I think you can't show me what he says. This one. This one? Okay. Teach me what he All righty, without further ado, we have Clifford's slides. I'm going to put it over here because we'll be able to go. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Clifford Slides. I'm a youth specialist and slash coordinator here. Um, Brittany asked me to present to you about. Um, t t teaching kids how to better communicate with adults. And I kind of changed that title to Teaching Little Humans About Being Human. Um, and, and I have really, because back in the day it used to be like, oh, this is an evidence-based model, so now we're being trauma-informed in the direction that things that we're going in now is like healing process. And so I really embraced that, so I changed the title. Um, so the, I I, I had created a presentation about two weeks ago. I was working on it, and um, I've, I've actually never been one to do this, but I actually just didn't like what I had created, so I, I, I remade it. Um, I hope that what I present to you is meaningful, that it's helpful. Um, I go to a lot of trainings that um, are not helpful, and so I know how frustrating it can be to go to a training and not provide any meaningful feedback. And so I, I really hope that this, that what I prepared for you is helpful and meaningful, that it changes your job. Um, but it is on teaching kids how to interact better with adults, there's no easy answer. There's no silver bullet. If there was, we would have given it to you a long time ago. 
Um, and so really all there is is principles. Most of what I'm saying is meant for the middle school and high school setting, except some of it does apply to elementary age. Um, I will add to one thing about this is that at, at, its core, like, at its core, the younger that kids are, you can just love them into changing. The younger they are, you can just, you can just love them and they'll change. It's, as they get older, that's when it becomes more difficult. Um, and when they're adults, that's when it's extremely difficult to get them to change. Um, but all right, so let's keep let's keep going. So oh, and I'm just gonna go until Brittany pats me on the shoulder and tells me to stop. Um, so really, what I want to do is like, how do you start? Well, the first thing you have to do is that it's like reducing stigma, um, reducing. And I, I'm assuming that you're all in the schools, and so reducing stigma amongst youth and young adults, that's easy. And so what I want you to focus on is reducing reducing stigma amongst the adults. Uh, amongst the teachers, amongst the counselors, amongst the administrators, that's when I say reducing to that's the area that you need to work in. Because my own experience has taught me, because um, I also used to be a high school teacher, my experience has taught me that um, it's not the kids that are the ones with the issues, it's the adults with the issues on how to combat this. The next thing is education, education, education. Education on all these topics like suicide, sexual health, sexuality, mental illness, addiction, all that stuff. Um, what, what I have found, and of course, we need to change the language just a little bit so that make sure that they understand. But the same information that you get shared about trauma or all those topics, you can share that with, uh, with, with your students. They love that stuff. They love learning that stuff. So the best thing to do is educate them. Um, the other part of that, too, is that it's crisis readiness. Um, suicide, anger outbursts. Crisis in general, that's not going to go away. It's never going to go away. It's, it's, it's here to stay. And so the best thing you can do is prepare for those things. Um, so keep going. So here's I, I, every presentation I give, I always share these things. Here's the five most important things. Um, the first one is identity. Kids who know who they are and understand who they are, whether that be cultural, cultural identity, gender identity, ethnic identity, uh, family identity, um, kids who know who they are handle toxic stress and trauma a lot better than kids do not, and they become more resilient and self-reliant. The same thing with choices. When they understand that they have choices and that also that other people have choices, it's the same thing, the same thing about the ability to express a place of belonging, so having a people that they're connected to. Um, for those of you that have children um, and you tell them stories about how they were born or about stories when they were little that they don't remember, kids know those stories, same thing. Also, like, do they know their family history and their genealogy of family, uh, family dinner? The part about this I want to add to you is that um, trauma, mental illness teaches kids those things. Kids are meaningers. They assign meaning to everything. And if you don't give them meaning, the negative things in their life are going to. And it's, that, that will become their identity. One of the things that you see a lot, I'm sure many of you have heard this, is that, like, people say, well, I am the I am pain, or whatever it is. Um, also, choices like trauma and mental illness, all that stuff, teaching kids that they don't have choices. Um, so that means they don't have control over their life. Also, for those who are also um, trauma and all that stuff, all the negative stuff, kids don't talk about it. No, they don't they talk about this. Um, oh, and also, please, please mute your line. Um, also, that's what's a place of belonging. And, um, was I so when I when I, when I, when I was teaching, uh, one of the things that we found is that all the kid all the kids in this particular like school, they um, all had uh, risky sexual behavior, suicidal ideation, like behavior problems. None of them had family dinner, and when we made an emphasis with parents to have family dinner, the problems did not go away. There's still drug use. There's still risky sexual behavior. There's still suicidal ideation, but boy, it drastically dropped. So having family dinner. Um, one thing that you can also do is that have, have lunch with your, with your students if you can. Um, if they're resistant to you or, they're, or you're working on building trust or whatever or you're just worried about them, the best thing you can do is, is have lunch with them. Um, one of my colleagues who is just she, – she is an absolute wizard at working with kids. Uh, one thing that she does um, is that she makes a, this huge casserole. And for kids that want to come in and have lunch with her, she allows them to. And it, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, so eating together is huge. Um, so 
the next thing I want to talk about is like social media. Um, if you guys remember back in 1998, the big thing on like the for social media was American Instant Messenger. So it was like, what's your screen name? Um, and so that was 1998. And then 2008, it was MySpace and Top Eight and all that stuff. And I remember Top Eight destroyed friendships. And then today, or I guess in, in 2018, it's not Facebook, it's Snapchat, Instagram. And so one of the things about the phone emphasize to you is that um, youth culture and social media are the same thing. You cannot separate the two anymore. They are the exact same thing. If you try to separate the two, then you're not, you're not going to be very successful. And so my own opinion on this particular topic is that it's only going to go more this way. I, and, and so the question is that in, in, uh, in 2028, where are they going to be? The answers are going to be on the dark web. If you don't know what that, actually, a lot of them already are. If you don't know what that is, don't look it up and ask someone what it does. So um, also the other thing about this, too, is that the reason why this is so enticing is because it gives kids, like, kids crave, like, four things. They crave real, authentic relationships and connection. They, they crave privacy. Um, they crave control. And the thing that offers all those things is cell phones and social media. Um, and so, anyway, so that's enough of that. Um, so with, the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is that there's prevention, crisis, and intervention. On the prevention side, um, I want you guys to become experts in two things. The first one is consent. Um, and I want to point out sex education in particular. Um, in the state of Oklahoma, um, the, the sex education is left up to the school board. And sex education is purely biological. It's the biological. It's the terms like penis, vagina, ovaries, testes. That, like, it, sex education is pure, purely biological. Sex education curriculums have nothing to do with consent, dating, violence, respectful relationships, and friendships. Um, and what you need a parent permission slip for is sex education. However, a lot of people misunderstand this and group it all together but I will say this, consent has everything to do with choices. You can frame those, have those conversations, and not have anything to do with sex. An example would be, um, can, I have, can I have your water bottle? That's a great thing about teaching consent. And so, um, but, but within these things, I, like any time that you can go to a sex education class, consent, any time you can do those things, go, go, go. The other one is safe messaging around suicide. An example would be of like, Say, like, don't say this, say that. I'll give you an example. Like, don't say committed suicide or successful attempt because it gives the wrong connotation. Say some die by suicide. Um, and also, the other thing about suicide is that suicide is not seen as a it, – it's seen – suicide itself is not the problem. The problem is the feelings around – that engender suicide. Suicide by young people is seen as the solution to their problem. And oftentimes, the reason why that's – that's the solution because they don't know what the other solutions are. And most kids are not suicidal, even though they have those thoughts and those tendencies. And so that's really, I want to emphasize that to you. And the other thing about this is that hotlines and assemblies are not the answer. We find more and more is that now I'm not trying to take anything away from those things because those are a needed component. But if we're going to address this effectively, it's not the answer. The answer is real authentic relationships. Um, but anyway, so the reason why I say these two things is because if you talk about these things um, and if you know how to talk about these things, it sends the message that you're a safe person. And when your students are dealing with these, they're more likely to come to you. The other thing about these two is that these two particular topics are connected to everything else. And so if you cover consent and safe message around suicide, every topic that they deal with, um, you're, 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 you're one conversation away from those topics. Um, so please become experts in this. Also, the other part about this, too, is that this is prevention. And my own opinion is that prevention is giving you the tools to process the crisis when it happens. And teaching kids these things is giving them these tools. So interventions. So those interventions are relationship-based. Follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. Have daily contact. Um, there's, there's always a need for knee-to-knee -knee conversation. And when I say knee-to-knee -knee conversation, I mean like one-on-one -on -one or one in a small group and really having a real honest, hard, uncomfortable conversation. 
Um, and also, despite popular belief, students still prefer face-to-face in person. Um, to have those tough conversations, yeah, you can say over text or over social media or whatever. No, 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 no. Despite popular belief, students still prefer the face-to-face interactions. Um, and also, here's the thing. If you're annoying, you're doing your job. If you are annoying, you're doing your job. Do not be insecure and say, oh, well, I talked to that, or I don't know if they'll leave. No, 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 stop being insecure. If you are annoying, you're doing your job. Um, the other thing, here's the thing. Safety and trust has to come first, and then disclosure comes. Kids do not disclose to adults about what's going on in their lives because they don't trust them. If you want youth to disclose or to, or to come to you about the difficult topics they're having, safety and trust. And um, you can even tell them about, like, privacy laws, too, about um, – and I'll constantly talk about those things. The other thing is that keep confidences. One of the reasons – one of the big issues that we have in school settings, even in the mental health setting, is that we don't keep confidences. We don't – we and, and youth know that and students know that, and they, they disclose to people that they feel are going to – that they can trust. Um, the other part about this is that education, education, education. Teaching kids about trauma, about mental illness, about behavior, about brain development. Teach them that stuff because I promise you they may act like they're not listening, but they're listening. And I want to – another point about this is that there's, there's, a, like, there's a, 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 a bajillion curriculums out there about how to address poor behavior and stuff like that. Um, oftentimes you are not in a setting to correctly implement those curriculums. That's okay. Create your own curriculum. And when I say create your own curriculum, based it off of the tools and the resources you have, and I'll give you an example. We have um, this, 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 one, this, one, this one young lady. She was sent to a school to address the behavior issues, and she gets them for 30 minutes once a week or once a day for six weeks. That's not really enough time to have any meaningful intervention. And so what, what she did was, she created her own six-week curriculum for this one week. All they talked about was um, was uh, consent. The next week was safe messaging on suicide. The next week was just everything about trauma. The next week was about anger. Then the next week was about self-care. And the next week was about dating, uh, like dating violence. And so she created her own curriculum. Another thing about these two is that teach them about trauma, teach them about A scores. Um, a lot of kids have questions about emancipation. Even though they may ask about emancipation, um, that doesn't mean that they're serious about it. And so you, you learn, learn the legal process of emancipation because when you have this information, again, they're more likely to come to you with their issues, and it opens up the door to have more meaningful conversations later. I'm also, again, about mental illness, too. So, so again, but the core of this is that successful interventions are based on relationships. Um, so becoming a safe person, uh, you have to create your own personal culture. Is that in your presence, what is acceptable and not acceptable, and what do you always talk about? And you have to always be doing that. Go to psych classes. Always sit in psych classes. Go to student clubs and groups like the, the GSA or like student associations that are around some form of social justice. Go to those. Um, English classes and the arts, the reason I point those out, I'll do it a little bit later, but really when you know English and arts, it's about human pain and suffering um, and making those connections with youth. Anytime there's sex education, go, go, go. Uh, also, your social media. Um, so also, like, your own social media. I promise you that your kid, the kids in your school have already found you. So and they, they, will judge your, they will judge your own readiness and your own safety based on your social media. If you're posting things that are even questionable about, um, like judging others or making assumptions about um, even like race or politics, they judge you off of those if you're safe or not. The other thing I would add is that always have food. Always provide food if you can. Now, those don't have to be a full meal. It can be snacks. Um, but the, the, question I, the picture I posted up here says, major depression is on the rise amongst everyone. And you look at the box, says, well, I mean, gestures broadly at everything. And so you have to also understand that the culture in which they live in and the messages in which, in which they get. Um, so be aware of those. So next one is addressing a culture. Um, the cultures around these things, like I've, yeah. I've learned for myself, is that like this, this yeah. systematic institution culture is a problem. And so there's systematic problems 
adults are the issue around these problems and having successful interventions. Um, bullying is almost impossible to address, and the reason why is because the, the, the main bullies have such high social capital and they're so popular, there's nothing you can do. And that's really difficult, and I understand that. I get it's frustrating. But when kids have that knowledge, um, it makes them more resilient. It's unfair, but it makes them more, more resilient. But I get it. It's hard. Um, every person is always just one conversation away from this closing. That's one thing you have to understand. Kids want to have authentic real relationships. If you present yourself as an authentic person, then great. They, that, that's what they need. Um, what's really interesting about when, like, say, like when a suicide occurs, it's always the hardest time is always the one-year anniversary. Um, so always be aware of that stuff. And the thing that's what is global is not local. I'll give you an example of addressing the culture. Um, the first picture is just was real recently of um, two, two students have, have killed themselves who were survivors of the Parkland shooting. Um, and if you just look up there, it says it gives the information, but also gives the suicide hotline. What's really interesting about the message that this sends is that there's no other resources for youth except this hotline. And, and that's the message that, 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 that they're getting. Um, and what they need is authentic, real relationships. As I said before, hotlines are helpful, but they're not the answer. But you have to remember, this is the message that they're getting, is that when suicide is the issue, the hotline is the answer. And typically, when kids, kids don't want to call a hotline. And when they do, oftentimes the feedback we get is that's not helpful. Now, again, I'm not saying this information to come down on this. I'm just telling you that, again, hotlines are – are, are a helper, they're not the solution. Um, but also going back to systematic change, where if you look at that text message, um, this is really interesting. No reason for you to remember, but there was a particular counselor at this student's school that this student did not like, couldn't get in to see this counselor when she wanted, et cetera, et cetera. Wrote about her and things she prepared for a seminar training, um, but she tweaked it up so it wouldn't be obvious it was about this woman. Turns out, um, the student wasn't the only one that had negative things to say about, about this person, but uh, this counselor is no longer there. And this was issues around these topics that we're talking about. And what we find is that creating this systematic culture change within the schools that you're in is hard and it is painful. Um, this particular student, I had asked this student about this because she had been through this process of this person eventually leaving because they weren't willing to be trauma-informed. And the response I got from the student was, I didn't think this would hurt so much. And um, the reality is that when you start addressing these issues, it is painful for them, it is painful for you, it is painful for all parties involved. And kids don't want to talk about this stuff because it is so painful. But if you create an environment and a culture around yourself, it, they're more likely to do it because they want to, even though it is painful. Um, so we're going to the next one. Oops, let me close that up. Yeah. Um, so the top right, top left, the text message that um, I got the other day from one of our students. I was like, "Hey, how's it going?" And they said, "It's going pretty crappy." Um, and so one of the things you have to be aware of is that these are some yuck issues, and you have to get used to that. But one of the things I always tell people is that. These are the waters we swim in. It is yucky, it is uncomfortable, it's painful, but these are the waters we swim in. And um, I've been saying that so much that now our youth say that these are the waters I swim in. And so creating a culture of we do hard things. And so when it comes to teaching human children at any age, it's safety and security first. They need to be safe. They need to know that you're safe. And then trust and friendship. They need to learn to trust you. And then, then consistency sincerity, and then intervention. That's how this works. Adults are the opposite to where they need trust and safety first, then intervention, and then trust and, uh, and trust afterwards. So, so what students, they need safety, trust, and then interventions. You have to be a safe person in order to have a successful intervention. So often people don't understand this, and they, um, they end up harming kids or pushing them away because there's no trust built. Um, so I like this one, too. So this one's uh, teaching little humans about being human, because that's really what this is coming down to. Um, the, I want to go to the, pic, the picture on the right first. Uh, it says, if there's anything you change about yourself, what would it be? This young lady wrote, nothing. I don't want to change anything. Then after she thought about it, she said, well, my attitude towards people. 
Um, so I thought this was a perfect example that if kids can be prideful, they can be arrogant, but when you really sit down to talk to them, they know the things that need to be changed. They know that something's wrong. And here's the thing. Kids don't come to adults to, to solve their problems. Adults need to help them recognize those things, and then that's when they can start working. Kids are not going to solve their own problems. Um, they need adult help to do that, and you have to be that helper. Um, the other part I want to emphasize, that one thing you can do is that I've just painted a Vincent Van Gogh. Um, if, if none of you don't know anything about Vincent Van Gogh, I want to share an experience with you. Um, there was one class where this teacher was was showing paintings of Vincent Van Gogh and was talking about very this very academic, artistic um, presentation about Vincent Van Gogh. No one was engaged, no one was listening. And then what they what they did was that then the teacher talked about his mental health issues, history of how difficult it was um, for him, the trials and the heartaches of his life. And then we went back and looked at then we went back and looked at those same paintings, and those kids were engaged and they listened. And the reason why is because here's someone, an artist, quote unquote, who got it, who understood how they felt. And so one thing about this is that teach kids what it means to be human, what it means to have struggles, have trials. How much time? All right, seven minutes left? All right. So, all right, we've got seven minutes left, so I want to go through this really quick. So, again, teach kids about being human. Be honest about the heartaches and the pains of this life. And you can you, – there's a billion artists, there's a billion people out there who have suffered with these things. It's the best thing you can do. Um, so empowering students. This is the best thing you can do to get them to, to, to interact with adults better. So look on the right. The, the messages they get about depression is that, oh, we're sad and it's, like, dark. But if you look at um, this list of celebrities, this is what depression really looks like. Teach them correct messaging about this topic, that this is what it really looks like. Um, now, we could slip in depression for suicide or mental illness, all that stuff. But if you also look on here, the other thing, too, is um, for the response is, this one had the most genuine-sounding sadness, and I'm all about that depression. And the response is, oh, I suggest this person to you if you really want some good depression. What's really interesting about this is that um, kids don't look to solutions to their problems. They look for validation of their feelings because their feelings are legitimate, and you need to be someone who validates those feelings. And once you validate them, that's how you create trust, and you can teach them what it, re what it really looks like and what it really is. Um, so here's the thing. Self-expression is self-discovery. Personal essays, art, writing, speech, performance, um, praising in front of others and correcting behavior in private, huge to building trust. Um, giving children functional purpose and meaning, that's a huge one. Kids are meaning givers, and if you don't teach them who they are, I promise you other things are going to. If you don't teach them who they are, other things are going to. So when students become successful, the best thing you can do is value content and character, not commas and grammar. Most of the kids that we see are going to be on IEPs, are going to be in special education, are going to have some type of, of learning dysfunction in their life. If, if we judge them off of the commas and the grammar, which will always be wrong, we need to stop doing that. What we need to value is their content and their character. And I'll give you an example. Let them write essays, and I promise you the grammar, the spelling will be horrendous. But if you really look at the content of what they're expressing, oh, my goodness, it's incredible. And if you understand that we can teach commas and grammar and spelling all day, value content and character. That's how you get students to become successful. Um, let me go back. So anyway, so this 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 text message on the right, um, I'll let you guys read that. I'm not going to read it, but it, kids will rarely come to you and say, "Oh, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it." You won't see the fruit of your labor, and that's okay. Be okay with that. Um, just be someone who prepares the way for them. That's what you need to be. Um, let me go on to the next one. Uh, anyway, so that's all I got. Thank you. The last thing I want to say with you is that kids who have gifts. All kids have gifts. When they're young, they're incredibly painful to use, and their pain and their pain in their life causes them to don't use those gifts. Let kids use those gifts. Anyway, so thank you. That's all I got. See you guys later. Thank you, Clifford, for your presentation. <laughs> so our next presenter is going to be Jerry. You can leave it there. Um, oh, you're trying to. 
So while Jerry is um, getting ready, I just want to recap so far. So for Nancy this morning, her presentation, the plenary, um, our, our opening plenary, it was all about in order to teach kids, you really have to show them. And the takeaways that I really want you to uh, focus on for Clifford is, you know, we talk about in BHA training is the first step to building a plan and helping a young person, regardless of what the teacher, the parents, and everybody else is seeing, it starts with engagement. Remember how we said you can't build a plan, you can't bring someone with them until they first have a relationship with you. They have to know that you're a safe person. So teaching youth healthy and effective communication skills starts with creating a strong relationship and a strong bond. Like I say all the time, you all get paid to play and interact and engage with children. That is how they learn. That is how they become to they come to trust you. It doesn't matter if they're elementary age, middle, or high school, but you need to spend time to get to know them and know what's important to them and what's in, who are the people that are important in their life and what are the skills um, and the ways that they want to give back. Um, creating and practicing an open and safe communication um, a, a, a safe space with them is modeling for the young person and teaching the skills that will help them to communicate more effectively with other adults. So like Clifford says, you provide them some basic education and skills about their own body, their own mind, what they're feeling, and when you create the space and you practice, you create a space for them to practice and use that time um, with you to explain and share how they feel, that's how they're able to effectively do that with their parents, with the teachers and the, you know, the people that are in their life and their community. So what I would like to say is, you know, a lot of Clifford's presentation was focused on the older young people, but I want you to know that those principles are transferable to our younger kids. So when you think about those spaces, especially in school environments, it may be going to the gym seeing how they interact on the playground, you see a lot. A playground is like a microcosm at a school. Seeing what happens in the cafeteria and in lunch, in the passing periods when the kids are getting dropped off in the morning, when the end of the day is over and they're waiting for their parents to pick them up or they're waiting for um, the bus ride, all of those opportunities and, and in their homes. And, you know, in after-school programs and things like that, all of those different places create spaces for you to see what's important to them. So just, just know that it is possible and it is a common practice to also teach younger kids um, to be able to effectively communicate and understand what's happening in their body and their mind. So, you know, we talk in our training about um, understanding trauma, what happens to the brain, and kind of like how we uh, – learned uh, the term flipping our lid, you know, when a young person has reached their capacity, when they're over their limit, it is possible to teach young people about what is po what's happening in their body, the reaction they're having in their mind, and to explain and be able to verbalize, you know what, I'm reaching my point. I'm reaching my limit. It's time for me to have a break. Because when they can explain and communicate that to you, then they also can learn how to explain and communicate their needs and concerns to other adults. And like Clifford says, you know, when we validate students, what we're doing is really truly listening to them. So without further ado, I'm going to have my friend Jerry to come up, and she wants to do more of like a question, uh, kind of like a discussion between the two of us, right, Jerry? For the most part, okay. I'll just send you an email, but I want you to okay. pull up, and then I want to kind of introduce it. Okay. I'm going to pull up Jerry's email. Uh, let's see. Here it is. That's what you sent me, Jerry? Yep. Okay. I'm going to make this beam set the timer so that we don't go over. I doubt there's a chance. <laughs> okay. So, Jerry, we start. You want to switch seats? Like okay. To okay, sure, though. Okay, first off, you guys, uh, I'm Jerry Mellendor. I'm coordinator of family involvement, and um, I'm a former family support provider in the field, as well as a parent. And this morning, you've heard a lot about how you help the youth, how you give the youth a voice, how you help them 
to understand things that's going on with them and ways to to make changes that uh, benefit them, including behavioral changes and things like that and supporting them. As coordinator of family support, one of the things I can tell you, the best way to help a youth is to help the parent. When a parent understands what you're teaching their youth, then it helps give an opportunity for that parent to take a deeper, stronger role as the parent for that youth that's going to also uh, build up their self, the youth self confidence. One of the things that that I know is in, in I know you work some outside of wraparound, but some of the cases probably you work as um, within wraparound, and those opportunities for when parents can understand what's going on with their child and how they can make things better. Um, one of the things that I've always said is when people teach the children but they don't also teach the parents, then you're not going to have that support for to maintain long-term change. And so that's why it's so important that the parents understand. Now, I, I did send a tool to Brittany, and she's got it pulled up here. We use big fancy words sometimes, like functional assessment. And, you know, parents don't really care about the big fancy words, neither do the kids. So this is actually a tool that, that can be used and instead of saying functional assessment, you know, what helps you feel better? Having a tool makes it easier also for our parents and the youth as well because it's really, this is visual. And sometimes when kids have behaviors that um, disrupt classrooms, disrupt things at home, a lot of times it might be triggered through sensory and trying to get them to think of ways that they can calm down in addition to those that therapists might say, you know, breathe deep and count to 10 and um, do your turtle technique, things like that. These are other things that we can ask and that we can share and have the parents to ask as well. I don't want to do, no. well, no, I was no. going to go up. Okay. Whereas, you know, what helps you feel better? Circle all that help you. This is going to give the child a voice, but this also, if you uh, provide this completed with the parent to the parent, that's going to give the parent more to go on. But I would love to see someone give this to a parent um, to also fill this out for their child on behalf, and then compare and see how much they both of them are understanding. And a lot of this is about sensory. So it's kind of like what helps you feel better when you get anxious? You know, is it maybe riding, doing the fidget tools, um, using toys or blocks, a bath. How do you like the bath? I, that, that would be a question I would want to know is how do you like the bath? Yeah. I have a daughter that will be in the bathtub if, if you give her. Uh, the opportunity, she'd be in bathtub for two hours. And that really is what she uses to calm herself down. Unfortunately, she she likes to be there when no one's at home, and that's not always particularly safe to be in a two-hour bath. But <laughs> um, stress ball or clay, that might even be making um, making their own – yeah, slime. Yeah, I have – uh, step granddaughter that she really that that calms her down. She makes her slime and and uh, and plays with it. A special blanket or cloth, or I would even say stuffed animal. Oh, you uh, have a weighted blanket. Yeah. Yes. We've had some family support providers that actually have learned how to make weighted blankets and have made some weighted blankets for some of the the kids that they work with. So. Um, that's really good. And then you have this kind of open, open-ended open question, other things that you touch or hold that can help you feel better because some of the visuals that's been given may not be anything at all that they're interested in. 
So then we go to the sensory, the, the sight, reading. Does reading help calm them down? Or being read to, depending on the age of the child. Watching TV, what, watching what kind of things on TV calms you down? Because we all know there are programs out there that does not calm. They, they amp them up even more. Looking at pictures, using a computer, it would be like playing a computer game again. We'd want to know which kind of computer game. We don't want to amp them up. Yeah, it could be their phone. Um, it could be a little tablet. Um, and then, again, open, uh, open suggestion for anything that they would like to see that helps them feel better. And we're going to go to, like, moving. Do they like to use a rocking chair? Do they like to sit on the lap of someone while they're rocking a chair? Do they like to swing? Does dancing calm them down? Music and dance. Oh, my goodness, music and dance. Uh, sports, whether they're actually on a team or not, just shooting hoops or yep, skateboarding, riding a bike, any of that, what does, does that? And it says, are there any other movements uh, that help you feel better? And they may not have something for each of these centuries, but I'm betting they will. I'm betting that they'll have some type of, of sensory uh, support that's going on. And this also gives parents, by using this, it gives parents ideas maybe that they had not thought of. And now we're going to get into hearing or listening. Do they like to talk on the phone? If they do, who do they like to talk to? Who is it? Maybe they like to call grandma and grandma can soothe them down. Listening to music, what kind of music, um, singing or humming. It doesn't say they have to carry a tune. It's kind of helpful if they can. <laughs> uh, do they just like to go to a quiet place? And if they do, where is that quiet place? What makes what makes that quiet place theirs that makes them feel good? Um, here's the counting to ten. Then um, you know, like deeper information like me. Um, do they like it loud? Do they like it? Soft, what kind do they like? Are there any other noises that help them feel better? Maybe. I knew a grandmother who was raising her granddaughter. The grandmother was having a lot of uh, problems sleeping at night. So was the granddaughter. And one of the things that the therapist started with the grandmother so she would sleep at night was to listen to, to the relaxing music, and she listened to Native American music the flute, and it was really beautiful. That was something she started herself that her granddaughter picked up on, and that became a new night ritual for them. That was such a beautiful gift for them because no matter what, that time at night was was their time, and, and it helped both of them to start sleeping better. Then here's that press, uh, pressure touch. Like we're saying, hugging a stuffed animal, sitting in a beanbag chair, because when you sit, all of that kind of comes up over you. And it's kind of like a big hug. Using a weighted blanket. Uh, there's also weighted stuffed animals. One of the girls also has <laughs> learned to, to use the, the little weighted beads to put in for a stuffed animal. Climbing on a jungle gym. Exercising. What kind of exercise? Sitting on a therapy ball um, and getting a hug, and not just getting a hug, but getting a hug from who? Who do you like hug? Who gives great hugs? It might be the little baby sister. They like to sit and rock and hold the baby and give the baby a hug and, and them be recipients of that baby's attention and hugs, too. Uh, other activities, blowing bubbles, deep breathing. Um, blowing up a balloon. Are there any smells that help them feel better? Is there something they really like? Maybe cook, baking cookies and the smell of ba fresh baked cookies or popcorn. Um, taste. I have one of my, um, she's my step-granddaughter, loves, and it soothes her to eat a lemon. 
she, every time she comes to Nana, she's always asking for a lemon, and it's just it, it's a ritual, but it also helps calm her down because she gets really, really excited. Um, and are there times that it's important for you to eat? She has a tendency to be a nervous eater, so we have to help her. And, and parents don't always know how to help a child. A lot of our kids are on medications that make them hungry all the time. They're mentally, they're hungry, at, at least mentally they're hungry. So when you have a child that's like that, parents don't always know how to deal with that. And many times we just give in, and then we have a child that may have uh, uh, problems with being overweight or being unhealthy. So um, finding out, you know, certain times and, and maybe after they've eaten that they can't eat anything again for a certain amount of time and maybe only uh, types of, of uh, snacks that's healthy for them. Um, and, and helping a parent understand those things is very helpful. So what makes you feel upset? So we talked about what helps them, and now we're talking about the things that could be triggers for them. And it's always great to have a bigger picture. So we have more uh, tools in our toolkit, and the parents have more tools in theirs to be able to help support our kids because families aren't going to be in services forever. The more tools that we can give during the time they're in services, the more successful and the better their outcomes are. So here is, um, you know, asking Maybe being touched, maybe being touched by certain people, maybe being touched in a certain environment is, is upsetting for them. Or if they're around too many people, um, they're not comfortable. Maybe if they're in complete darkness. I know one of my granddaughters cannot sleep without a, a nightlight on. She's had some trauma in her past, and she actually, her, her mother, my daughter has a great trauma history as well. So uh, that would be an opportunity and has been an opportunity for us to teach my, my daughter about how trauma can affect her and how it's okay then for her and her, her daughter to, to use a nightlight or a glow stick or one of those little glow worms as, as a, something to sleep with. Loud noises. That's a trigger for a lot of people, getting whether it's loud or not, but being startled, um, of course, yelling. And having a child who may be sensitive to someone being yelling at them, I would say most of us are sensitive to that. But for us sharing this with a parent without judgment can kind of maybe help the parent realize that they're adding and contributing to stress and uh, trauma for their children just by being able to look at this visual of things that, that makes things worse for them. Thunderstorms, um, that also can help for when a parent understands the, that thunderstorms are scary for them instead of just telling them to go back to bed and be quiet, they can go back up to what helps me and think of some things that that would support that child during a thunderstorm. Um, it didn't list at the top. There's also such things as weighted vests. Uh, it, it's crazy because it helps dogs during thunderstorms, but I can tell you it helps children, not only in school but at home. When they're, they're getting anxious and stuff, those weighted vests really help. Um, Jerry, I was going to say the loud noises might not even be in the house. Um, I was just telling Jerry, I think with the with the sound, um, we we might want to help the parents also recognize that sometimes it may not be what's going on in the house. It could be what's going on in the neighborhood. Right. So if you live in an apartment complex or in a neighborhood and you hear lots of yelling or loud talking outside or maybe for the kids they've heard gunfire yeah. or they've heard slamming of as in the slamming of bodies, like people fighting. Um, lots of honking, things like that. That also could be something that creates some, some stress and some anxiety for them as well. 
Right. And, you know, we're in Oklahoma. We've been having more and more earthquakes. Well, they've actually kind of slowed down. but They slowed down um, with fracking, but we still get them. Yeah, we still do. We absolutely do. And that's very... Yeah. Yep. Every Saturday at noon when they go off, my kids are saying, what's up, what's up? Mm-hmm. So, other things. You know, are they missing someone? Did did they have a grandparent that passed away? Did they have a pet? Don't don't overlook the importance of pets. Um, being left alone. Some children just aren't, they're just not ready to be left alone, and they want to cling on to their family, to their parents. Um, being surprised, a lot of people try to tease the kids. And now I'm, I have an older son that loves to tease his nieces, but that is not funny. We have to kind of calm him down uh, to leave leave the girls alone because it, it is very disturbing for them. It, it dysregulates them for sure mm-hmm. um, when they're when he's teasing them and surprising them, tickling them, roughhousing with them. Um, one of my granddaughters that has some autism uh, spectrum issues, that is not. That, that's not a way to, to play with her and, and be her friend, for sure. Um, you know, maybe they've had a fight with a friend. Maybe they're at home all the time and they don't have visitors, and that's something they would like, maybe to reach out and um, be a, more of a part of their community. Because a lot of times when you're a family and you have a child that has uh, behavioral health issues, you isolate yourself from your community, your family, and your friends. And, and that can be really hurtful. That can be really harmful and um, disheartening to the children. If the kids are hungry, if they're tired, uh, someone's being mean to them, all of these things. And then again, we have this left up and again is uh, anything else that makes you feel upset. So you're going to give them the opportunity to do that. Then start kind of addressing the things, how it happens, what happens to their body when they're angry or when they're scared or when they're upset, and uh, have them figure out, you know, what what these different uh, feelings does to them and, and, and all. So this is what I have brought as a tool for you guys, and, and Brittany will have it. And I'm going to open. We have just a little bit of time left for Brittany to ask me any questions that she thinks that I need to make sure that I cover. So what I'll add to what the tool that Jerry is sharing is um, I think the, the takeaway from Jerry's section is, you know, it can be very wrong for us to assume that the parents just have it all figured out. Now, that doesn't mean they don't know anything about their kids. But at the same time, sometimes they may may be just as puzzled about what's going on. And like Jerry said, there's a way that we can introduce or help them to understand that there may be things just like for the teachers, things that the teachers may do thinking that they're they're, um, giving tough love or making the situation better, it may actually be making the situation worse. Mm -hmm. So how do we offer that in a way that is educating for them and that can give them ideas so that they can start to come up with solutions at home? And like Jerry is saying, if we want it to be sustainable, um, we have to get the caregivers, the parents involved. If we don't, what we're asking the kids, we're teaching them to do and asking them to do, they can't do it all by themselves. They don't live in isolation. They live in homes, and they're a part of a family, whatever their family looks like. So how do we teach that? So what I will make sure that I do with this tool is I think um, I don't want you all to sell short some of the pictures. We've learned from um, some of the tools that we have from our transition age, um, for our transition age youth. The pictures look kind of kitty, and the misnomer was that teenagers would be kind of turned off by the pictures, but they actually think they're funny and they take an opportunity to like draw on it as they're going through the activity. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is just think for the young people that you're working with, if this, these graphics work. And then the other thing I can do is make one where the graphics maybe are not for some of them are, are less cartoony and we still cite the reference to give them 
um, to give them the credit, but um, I'll make sure that I add this to the Google Drive. So my first question for Jerry is, Jerry, can you tell us really briefly for the behavioral health aides that may not have children um, or be parents or they're younger, what's uh, a couple of tips in terms of helping them to feel confident to help uh, educate and teach parents um, how to support the learning that's going on with their kid without feeling like, I don't feel like I can say that because I'm not a parent or I'm like, you know, 25 and here I go trying to tell a parent, you know, what they need to do with their kid. What are some tips that you have for them being younger? Okay. First off, be genuine. Be genuine. Don't, this is not a time to fake it until you make it because I am one of those parents. If you come in and try to tell me to how to parent my te- my teenager, if I get that from you, then I will immediately shut myself down, and I will think there is nothing you can teach me. But if you come in and you're genuine and say, I know I don't have children, uh, I mean, if that is something you feel you need to, but just offer respect. That, that's what I'm Look at the things that the parents have done well and comment on that. That kind of starts building um, a relationship and communication between the two of you. If you can catch them at something that you know that they've done well, um, that sets you up to have a better opportunity to be real with, um, you know, some options and, and make sure they understand here's some options. Here's some things that we're doing and wonder if you would be open to practicing these with, with them at home. We see it working at school. Maybe it will work at home. And, you know, here's a mistake that a lot of us, and I'll, I'm going to say parents, a lot of parents believe that when we get services, when we have reached out to get services from other people, we expect them to be the experts that you're going to fix our kids. The reality is, especially if you don't have children yourself, is to make certain the parents understand they are the experts of their child. They are the experts. They know their child. They've raised their child. They know what they've tried. They know what has worked and what hasn't worked. They, they just have that underlying expertise that, any provider, even a provider with ch- with their own children, does not know and feel about their family. So if we respect them and let them know that we expect uh, that, that they are the experts of their children and we're going to work together to try to, because you're the expert of what you do in the behavior area, being a BHA, you're an expert there. They're an expert of their children, and um, I think that show of respect is what will help break those barriers down to where the two of you can partner together. So what I like to say is for our behavioral health aides that are embedded in schools, for you all there's an additional option. So for our families, um, behavioral health aides that might be health home specialists or working with kids that are enrolled in wraparound or service coordination, you have this broader support of the care coordinator, especially your family support providers that you should pull on to really help bond and and form those relationships with the parents. So you have a little bit more help. Um, For you all that are embedded in schools, sometimes it can be kind of tricky. So what I like to say is always start from the beginning, all the way at intake. Don't, um, you know, that you might feel that the first battle is getting the, the parents to want to enroll their kid in services, or is a, maybe they say, we don't want, we don't want any wraparound, but I'll do the BHA only, this only. If that's the case, please don't check out at intake. If you have a, the chance, the opportunity to be a part of the intake, it might be extremely useful to be there so you can reinforce some of these things that Jerry is saying is that so I'm not here to fix your kid. I can't do that. You know your child. You know, I know how to help support them to learn new skills and to, to get some different results. We need to work together. So 
I, I this can't be the the last time that I see you, or it can't be that, or speak with you. It can't be, you know, it's nice to meet you, and I see you in another three months. We we have to stay in communication on a monthly basis. Um, sometimes in the beginning, it might be on a weekly basis, but in, you know, encourage them that you're not just going to be checking in when things are going wrong. You want to let them know when things are going well with their kids. So I think for you all it, for, that are embedded, it really has to start an intake. And if you can explain that and be there as a part of the process, then parents are not getting this um, false idea like Jerry is saying that, you know, I signed my kid up, now go forth and work with my kid. Why are you calling me? No, I don't need to have any meetings with you. So as we move forward, the, one of the last questions I have for you, Jerry, is um, what suggestions would you have for behavioral health aides where they feel like they're trying to reach out to the parents, they've called, they might try to go by the house, they've sent letters in the mail, they've sent text messages, they've left voicemails, and they still feel like um, they're not getting much of anything back. Or maybe they've met with the parents, they've kind of had that initial conversation, the parents seem to be on board, and maybe the, the parents have a whole lot going on. They might have multiple kids, multiple life issues, um, they might have a couple of things they've written down, you know, for the parents that they've agreed that they're going to work on, but it seems like they're at a stalemate, like they things have stalled. What should they do to try to um, build that relationship so then they can actually help support the parents? Sometimes their biggest hump is we just need them to, I just got to get a hold of them. I'm having the hardest time for them even connecting. Well, first I would say the fact that, uh, you've been working with their child, um, you know, don't assume they don't care about the kids. That's the first thing. Just because you're not communicating doesn't mean that. Um, as Brittany says, they could be very, very busy. Uh, as a parent myself, um, I would love to see my child come home with a little certificate or something, some little accomplishment with a personal written note from you saying, I just wanted you to know that Johnny did this today. Uh, would love to talk more with you and then a phone number, you know, and see if maybe that would be enough. And just keep on. Be persistent. Keep on sending those notes. Um, and, you know, it, it, it is what it is. But I think the more effort that you can put out and, and by being strength-based and telling the parents, even if they don't seem connected with you about the progress that their child is making, I think eventually will win out. So what I hear you saying, Jerry, is that persistence is, it goes back to our wraparound principle of unconditional care. Yes. This, is, this is what it looks like. It can be very difficult mm -hmm. and it can be tedious, but <laughs> just keep reaching out, keep sending the notes, mm -hmm. keep calling, because, um, see, we're already set up as parents. We're already set up of always hearing about our kids doing bad things. They're always getting in trouble, and, and certain people can with us then. So this would be a, an opportunity to do something different than what everyone else has been doing. A new dynamic. Yes. So being persistent can pay off. What I will also say is make sure the phone number didn't change. I've had some of our behavioral health aides say they were sending, um, leaving voicemails, they were sending text messages, and only to find out that the parent's phone was cut off or they switched and got another phone. So make sure you have backup numbers to the backup numbers. Make sure that maybe for the parent, if they can give you the name and phone number of like two other people that know how to get in contact with them, rely on your school too. Um, as much as parents may avoid you like the plague, if they get a call from the principal or the school resource officer or the counselor or the special ed teacher, um, they don't want to, but they will call back or they don't want to make time at that point, but they're like, I don't have time, but I will speak to you right now. So if you need to pull those people in, but we're like Gary saying to change the dynamic in a positive way. So there's like, I've, I've been, really knocking down your door to try to get a hold of you to let you know how well your kid is doing. I want you to know how awesome they're doing, and I just want to give you that update. So I just want to make sure I hadn't heard from you. Mm -hmm. Is this phone number still good? Oh, yeah, it's still good. I just didn't have time to call you back. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Well, can we meet in another week? So I, I would add one thing to that. Mm -hmm. If we're bringing the school in to help, and that's a great idea, we need to coach our, our school 
to be to interact yes, not to say she's been trying to get a hold of you for three weeks and you haven't called. You really need to call her because that just threw you under the bus mm-hmm. and you are not going to. That's going to set the not going to set the tone that you want to set. So uh, help them as they're making that call to the parent understand this is an opportunity for them to brag on that that parent's kid too. So we're in that process. You're not just teaching the parent, but we're, like we said, our wraparound and our system of care values, other partners get it, but they don't always understand it, and they don't know how to practice it. So this could be a great opportunity to coach the counselor to say, hey, I couldn't get a hold of the parent for the past two weeks, but when you call, can you please be super nice? Can you be super kind and sound excited and say, hey, it's a really great reason why I need to get a hold of you because we have some really great news about your son, and we want to share it with you. That's very different than like Jerry said. She's been trying to get a hold of you for the past two weeks. You haven't returned her call. It's going to be a problem. So yeah, that, that that would absolutely set a BHA up. Yeah, for Negatively. failure. Negatively. We don't want to throw you under the bus, no. and we don't want you inadvertently throwing yourself under the bus. So with that, I would like to tell Jerry, thank you so very much, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. We're going to go on to our next speaker for the day. For just a moment. And our next speak our next speaker is going to be um oh I'm sorry. We have a we we have a break. We have a longer break than I even intended to have. So we're going to take a break right now. This is actually it says till eleven o'clock. So I'm gonna keep what our agenda says. You all have um, a morning break, enough time to check some emails, um, uh, go take a bathroom break, go walk around. I will play some videos during the break. If you have questions, email me or send me um, a message in the chat function, and we will resume at 11 o'clock with um, Benji, um, who is talking about um, teaching new teaching youth new coping skills and strategies. So during this break time, I'm going to upload some more of the uh, presentations to the drive, and I'll show some, some videos and things to watch during our break time. So we will come back at 11 a.m.
Cheyenne Witt. Hi, we're on the break right now until 11 a.m., so you can just hang out or feel free to walk around, take a bathroom break, and come back.
many fields of research, especially formulas, rubric, paper graphs. Clean with Linus and spray on the shelf. really want to play soccer at home now, but when the bell rings, you can't find your shoes. You finally get out to the field, the team has been kicked, and it's too late for you to play. Maybe you got so mad that this small effort became a big problem in an instant. When we lose control of our emotions like this, we can call it flipping your lid. Kind of like the way a pot might do if it was too full and too hot. A little while later, after you've cooled down, you might even feel sad when you realize that when you had a big reaction to a little problem, you could have hurt someone's feelings. What if I told you that this happens to everyone? Your parents, friends, teachers, and everyone else you know can flip their lid and lose control of their emotions in time. We all need to work on managing our feelings. Have you ever wondered why we can have such a hard time keeping our emotions under control? It can be really tough being a kid these days. There's just so much fun every day. At home, at school, even 
an after school. Sometimes it's hard to keep a lid on things, and we act in ways that are not kind or true, even though we don't mean to be hurtful. There are so many situations that we encounter every day that can cause our emotions to bubble up. Maybe you felt upset or frustrated when you were working on a problem or activity at school and just can't seem to get it right. Maybe something unexpected or embarrassing happened to you in front of your friends. Maybe you had something important to say but didn't get a chance to say it. These and many, many more situations can cause both of from their list. So why does this even happen? Well, it has to do with the way our amazing human brains work to help keep us safe. This is your brain, the part of your body that controls everything you do. Let's take a closer look at the parts of the brain and how they can work together to help us keep a lid on things. The brain is a pretty complicated organ, so we're going to help us visualize what's happening in here. Let's imagine that our brain has an upstairs and a downstairs. Here, where our thumb is, is called the midbrain. This is where our emotions and memories are created and stored. Below that is your brain stem. The brain stem controls the things our bodies do that we don't have to think about, like breathing. It also controls our automatic reactions to certain situations. For example, if you touch a cup of hot tea in it and it's too hot, your downstairs brain feels the pain and will pull your hand away to stop you from getting burned. It's an automatic reaction. You don't have to stop and think about what to do. Or, imagine you're out on a hike and a bear wanders onto the path. Your brain doesn't stop and think, what kind of bear is it? Is it friendly? Your downstairs brain notices that you feel scared. It takes charge and in a split second decides whether or not you should fight, fly, another word for run away, or freeze. Because of the way our downstairs brain reacts to these situations, we can think of it as our emotional brain. Because it reacts instantly, no needing to think things through. Always ready to take charge in any situation to help keep you safe. So, if this is our downstairs brain, then this part where the back of our hand and fingers are can be seen as our upstairs brain. It's called the cerebral cortex. This part of our brain helps us think logically, act with kindness, and think about how others might be feeling. It's also the problem solving part of our brain. It helps us to think of possible solutions to a problem and decide which one is best. The upstairs brain is our thinking. Your upstairs and downstairs brains don't work alone. Your brain is set up so that the downstairs brain can communicate with everyone. We send messages and connections to questions all the time about what our bodies feel and need. Let's take a closer look at our brain set. Where our fingertips are is the logic and reasoning part of the brain. It brings into action when we have a problem to solve. Usually, it does a great job of doing it. Sometimes, it can have a hard time solving a problem if the emotional brain is can't communicate well enough. This can happen if your emotions get too overwhelming and your downstairs brain decides that this situation might be dangerous, even if it isn't really. And we all know what happens when our downstairs brain thinks you're in danger. It triggers our fight, flight, or freeze response. Our emotions start to bubble up and then suddenly everything boils over. We flip our lid. This can look like a scary, angry reaction, or it might be crying or running away from a problem. Now that we've flipped our lid, See how far away our fingertips are from the midbrain? When our lids are flipped, our upstairs and downstairs brain can't talk to each other. Our emotions have become too strong, and we can't think clearly and can't solve the problem in a peaceful way. So what can we do to stop us from flipping our lids? Well, it all starts with realizing that we're about to flip our lids, and then turning down the heat so it doesn't happen. Remember that soccer game we talked about at the beginning of the video, and you were really upset and didn't get to play? Maybe you felt your or you felt your face getting hot? Did your heart start to pound and did you feel your hands start to clench? Were you frustrated, disappointed, and angry? These types of strong feelings are all indicators that you might be close to flipping your lid. If you feel this start to happen, it's a good idea to walk away, take a deep breath, and look for an adult to talk to before you flip your lid. It might be a parent, a grandparent, a coach, a teacher, or another trusted adult nearby. They can help you with strategies to solve the problem once you've calmed down enough for your upstairs brain to be ready to do some peaceful problem solving. If you do flip your lid, those same trusted adults can offer you some time and space to cool down before you start to problem solve together. Once your upstairs brain is back in charge, share your story and get some help. You 
something I think can help you to tell an adult what you need. I need a hug. I need you to listen to what I have to say. I need another chance. I need some alone time. I need a walk. I need you to see that I can do well. Learning more about the brain and how it works can really help us to understand our emotions and to be peaceful problem solvers. When we listen to our bodies and our brains, we can turn the challenges of being a kid into opportunities to learn and grow. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in learning more about the brain and how to manage emotions, some resources are linked in the description box below.
All right, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you had a good break. So we are going to get started. I don't know what this little thing is in here. Our next presenter is before we have our lunch break is going to be Benji Rendon. Um, Benji is a former behavioral health aide. He is now a school-based therapist. He's awesome. Benji's uh, section is going to be on teaching youth new coping skills and strategies. So I'm going to pass the presentation ball to Benji. You might see your screen flicker really quickly because Benji is going to have control so that he can lead his presentation. All right, Benji, take it away, and you just need to share your screen, and everyone will see what you see. Which button would that be? Hold on. Okay, so if if you look at the very top um, in the bar under share, if you click that, then click where it says my screen. Got it. Perfect. All right. So Benji is presenting. He's getting his stuff up. There we go. Great job, Benji. All right. All right. Yay for technology. Um, So as uh, Brittany kind of mentioned, um, my name's Benji, and so I was a former BHA um, back when uh, the program was kind of young and we were getting everything started over here. Uh, at Red Rock. So uh, what I'm going to present to you guys, I know that a lot of the informer or a lot of the presenters have given you a lot of useful information and a lot of skills and a lot of topics for you guys to research. Uh, what I'm going to have y'all do is kind of create a treasure box so that way you guys can be a little bit more um, with resources at, at the you know at the grass of y'all's fingertips. So just in case you do have a kiddo that needs anything, you'll be able to do that because, of course, if you have resources, those form a lot more new strategies, more coping skills, and I'll show you some of the websites, and I'll actually take you all there um, to let you all know what what these things look like. So we'll kind of go forward. Okay. So the point of having the treasure box is what I call it. I know everybody uses the toolbox, but I like to be different, so... I like the treasure box because there's always something rewarding in the treasure box. Uh, It's for you to be well-informed on what you're doing. If you're feeling overwhelmed, to come back to your box to help you. As I said, you know, the treasure box is really meant for you to be, you know, rewarded and be able to know that, okay, I'm stuck, but let me go ahead and uh, go to my treasure box, pull out whatever I need, and be able to have that with me. Um, keep you keep your information updated. Things that you thought you knew, uh, you can grow and evolve. Um, the point of this little treasure box is to always keep it updated. I mean, there's things always happening around the world, uh, things that kids and uh, some teenagers see that you guys are going to have to, like, be well-rounded about and know how to be able to help. Because, um, like I said, things change. Uh, there's a lot different Um, than whatever when we used to grow up. And I always talk to the kids about that. Um, Just like earlier when they were talking about the social media, um, we didn't have that back. I mean, back when I was growing up, if something happened, it happened. But now these kids have to uh, relive it it through some of the social media uh, Snapchat things. So uh, just kind of be involved, be informed, keep up to date on what's going around, uh, you know, in the kids' world. Uh, to share your knowledge, passing along information is important to creating a more trauma, mental health sensitive environment. Um, you guys that are in school, I mean, you guys are just going to have to continue sharing information with some of these teachers that don't believe in trauma uh, or have a hard time believing that everybody's affected by something. Um, these resources and these things will have you, you can point them to them, that way they can uh, be a little bit more informed uh, so that they can be able to use some of the strategies that you're seeing. Um, because, you know, some of you that, like I said, are embedded in the school, there's some teachers that don't really know. Some of you that are out of the uh, school and kind of work along with the families, this is also helpful information to kind of share with those families. 
So we have the first resource is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. Lots of knowledge about mental health. The specific link takes you to a page with all the information, and I'll show you that page. Whenever you guys get these slides, you can kind of hit the link, and it'll take you directly to that page. So this one is showing you just behavior health equity. Um, I hope I said that right. I probably did. But um, pretty much on this page, it's kind of showing what uh, for different cultures, ethnicities, uh, gender, uh, what kind of things affect their population and how you can be able to work with them. Um, this is a very information, uh, very uh, good page loaded with information. And if you just click the population, it'll take you and it'll show you different statistics, uh, different uh, topics that you can bring around and how they kind of view mental health. Um, so if you're in a school or deal with a family of several different cultures, this is something good to kind of go back and learn and kind of go here. And then for those Spanish speakers uh, or people dealing with uh, people that speak Spanish, there's also uh, resources here in Spanish. Um, the next one that we'll talk about is, of course, the – I think everybody's a little more uh, – they know about this website, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, let me see here. Yes. So the National National Child Traumatic Stress Network, of course, the main page has lots of uh, informa uh, information, lots of tidbits about trauma. And then, then this specific link, whenever you click on the link, it takes you to the Learning Center. Uh, you can continue taking these um, little, uh, I guess what they are, webinars and just learning about the different populations as well and how everybody deals with trauma and can give you a little bit more of a background and more information on how to help those students. Uh, here's a good one with schools and grief, helping students cope with death um, and all that. So that's, that's just, like I said, more information for you to have and more information for you to pass along if need be. Um, let me see. Let me go ahead and pull this other one up. The next one is the motivational interviewing for schools. Now, I know motivational interviewing, I know it's, it's kind of taught around the, a lot of fields. Uh, I know in healthcare they use it. Uh, I think it's hopefully trying to come into the schools. And what motivational interviewing is, you know, just kind of listening and reflecting. Um, and on my slide it says, if it feels too therapeutic -y, don't touch it, just, you know, leave it alone. Uh, but for some people that can, just reflect. A lot of kids reflect, and a lot of kids take a lot, you know, you guys are a safe place and a safe person to talk to uh, once you create that environment, and they'll come and tell you things. Uh, a lot of people um, may not tell their parents what they're going through just because they don't want to feel judged or they don't want to get in trouble. And for you, you guys are coming in with no judgment and, you know, hopefully teaching them good skills and, you know, what to do with their, um, you know, with, with the actions that they choose. Um, and with motivational interviewing, it's just reflecting. You're, you're, you're really just, oh, so what's going on there? Why? Uh, just a lot of questions, and it can it can it can change some people, you know. Uh, for example, I mean, I think we all do it in our everyday lives, where our significant other or who something will be like, "Oh, you got a bad habit, you know? Why are you why are you picking your nose?" And you'll be like, oh, "Leave me alone! You're judging me." And then one of your friends could come up and say, "Hey, why are you picking your nose in public?" And you can reflect and be like, "Huh? I don't know why. Maybe I should kind of." Keep an eye for that. Um, so it's just something there for you to have in your treasure box so you can kind of look over, be aware of that, um, and kind of help out the kids from there. Uh, a big one, this is, this is what I found, and this is a really, really, really good and useful uh, website. Uh, it's the PBIS World. This page is loaded with different interventions, different behaviors that you can choose from. As you can see on this screen, it has um, pretty much where the behavior. So let's say we have somebody acting out aggressively or bullying. Uh, we're going to go ahead and 
choose that behavior. And what it will what it'll take you to is the student may, it'll give you symptoms or what you're seeing, extreme irritability, uh, becoming easily frustrated. Um, and so when you see this, you'll be like, oh, yeah, that definitely describes, you know, little Joe there. He's definitely, you know, bullying other kids. So you click yes, and what it will provide you is interventions on what you can be able to do. You know, of course, the Tier 1 interventions for aggressive bullying, uh, try multiple interventions, and different things, and then what's the cool thing about this intervention skill is that you can, it'll take you and it'll give you more specific information. So you can click, let's go ahead and do the uh, teach coping skill. So I'll pull up a new web, a uh, new page, and it'll say, what should I, why should I do it? Improve, you know, you can read there, when should I do it and how do I do it, you know. Uh, depending on the situation, need, and child, there are numerous ways to teach kids coping skills, and there's a whole bunch of resources and supports for the techniques and finding different ways on how to be able to teach uh, the kid the coping skills. So this was a this was a big website that I found, and um, I think it'll help the BHAs um, or anybody in general. This could also be good for the teachers. Um, you know, they're already some are familiar with the PBIS. Uh, positive behavior intervention. Uh, I think it's service. I may be may, may, I may be making that last part up, but um, Bindi is that, positive behavioral interventions in schools. You were you were in schools. schools. Okay. See, I since I work, you know, I always attach the service. I always attach the S with services, but in schools. So um, these are just. This is a helpful page. Um, you can pass this along uh, to your teachers as well, and you can kind of work together there uh, to see what can, you know, what y'all can be able to do for the kiddo. Uh, let me see here. The next, the last website, the last resource is Love and Logic. This one, um, this is how to create Love and Logic in the classroom. It may, by, may not be directed towards you guys because you guys don't have, you know, a huge classroom with 30, 40, you know, personalities in there, but there are some good um skills that you can use there with the kids. And with kids learning and following and, and, and uh, being impressionable, one of the biggest things is that they're going to look at you as models. Uh, some people that uh, you guys, whatever you do, some of them, may, they may look up at you and be like, wow, you guys, you, you're a really positive influence, you know? Um, and so demonstrating them with uh, some of these techniques that are being taught here. There's a good book uh, that you guys can get uh, by looking through the website, but it just teaches you good techniques and how to apply, you know, logic. You know, if you got a kid, uh, I know in in in, uh, in our schools, in a middle school, there's some kids that like to hang out all day or want to hang out all day, and, uh, and at some point you're like, okay, you know, I I can't see you right now. We got other kids to see, and they might throw a fit, but it's like, look, I understand and I appreciate you, but we have to move on, and you have to go back to class. Now, that's not being mean. That's just kind of showing love and being logical about that, you know, the choice that you're, um, that you're presenting. That way they can be like, okay. And, and you know, you won't, you won't damage any rapport there uh, because it's how you're saying it and, um, and applying that logic. And, you know, kids can see past that and they can see uh, that you're really trying to be nice and being helpful towards, you know, them being, uh, being able to pass in school. So hopefully those are good websites that you guys can use uh, going forward. One thing that what I would advise is that you guys create your um, – let me get back on here. That you guys create on your Internet uh, bookmark tab to uh, have, a, have just a little folder there that has just resources. Have those websites there, be able to create that folder. That way, whenever you're having an issue or problem, you're like, I'm stuck. I need to teach this kid something new. You, you can, boom, click on it, and it'll show you what to do. Um, and it's also good information there to have the kid uh, be able to uh, look at it with you. Um, it can help you prepare for the day. That way you know that this kid is doing whatnot, and you can be able to create a plan and look at those resources and be like, okay, well, I know how – you know, this culture may 
be able to uh, how they see mental health. Let's see what you know good coping strategies are here and all this different stuff. Uh, so definitely have a folder on there that has your resources. Other useful resources for you to have is you know create your nearest hospitals for emergencies. Um, the uh, what is it? It's it's always good to know about the other institutions and where they're located and what services they offer. You know. And that's talking about the nearest hospitals and the inpatient facilities as well as other behavioral institutions. You always want to be able to have those resources there so just in case a kid has a crisis that you know and you're well known on what's going on around your uh, neck of the woods. Uh, local shelters as well. Uh, these programs can be such as, you know, the YMCA to help the family engage in a healthy life, but also as well as other resources such as the YWCA or other programs that may help out in domestic abuse. Um, those are those are things that are going to help you strengthen your relationship with the family in their time of need and also to be able to provide that kid that safe environment which they need in order to flourish. Um, be able to see the other programs that offer family help. Uh, those could be, you know, your local food pantries. Some of the schools, I know the school that we work at, we have a food pantry. I didn't know about it, but, um, you know, I didn't know about it the first year I started there. But, you know, the next year I finally got informed that we do have a food pantry. And so that was helpful for some of the kids to know that way they can, you know, have food for the weekend. Um, you know, uh, other programs, uh, local colleges. These local colleges sometimes offer free classes that can benefit the family. These are also about creating new strategies for you to have, you know, if a kid has an anger problem, okay, well, what can we do about that? Let's think about what, you know, your local college may have, you know, youth sports or something that can be able to help them, or maybe they teach them a class on anger management. That's good to have right there. Um, you know, as I said in the first, keep updated, be informed, go over those um, informations in that way that you can create, and you'll teach those kids the new coping strategy. Uh, local clinics. Uh, clinics help families that have not seen doctors in what could be years. I know doing some health screenings, uh, some of the you know parents are like, I haven't seen a doctor, or they haven't seen a doctor in, I don't know, last year, two years, I don't know. And so helping them be able to provide those because as we're taught in the mental health field, you know, health affects mental health and mental health affects health. So you always want to be able to know that that kid is taken care of health-wise because, you know, it could be he has a pain in his foot and it's broken or he doesn't know it's broken and all of a sudden that's why he's mad. Somebody stepped on his foot and that's why he blows up and throws, a, throws around chairs and whatnot. Well, you know, that may be an intervention and a coping strategy or whatnot. You get him connected to a clinic, boom, his foot's healed, you're good. That kid hasn't had a, uh, a tantrum in so many weeks now. Um, one good thing is look over IEPs and 504s. A lot of the kids have IEPs and 504s. Some of them already have the behavioral um, intervention plan, a BIP, placed. So you can kind of continue with those strategies and those skills uh, to help out and follow that. Um, it's just important for everybody to know that works in the school system how these how the 504, the IEP affects the kiddo and, you know, and to help them if their needs are not being met. You know, it's very, it's illegal if a school has the kid on an IEP and it doesn't supply the resources for them to fully flourish in the classroom. So that may be something that you can see um, that your kids have, you know, behavior problems because they're frustrated. They can't learn. They're not being provided the chance to. You as a behavioral health aide have that chance to be able to intervene and say, hey, look, this is not being followed. And boom, you know, this kid could be able to learn. And now that everything is being met, you went and implied that strategy. Um, and now the kid is able to function. So one of the biggest things whenever I went in as a BHA is just how to be aware. Um, I went in and I researched my area. One thing before you go into any any environment or anything is research your area in your school. Be informed about what your school's attendance is, where they cut off, where they're being, where they're, where, you know, their whereabouts, uh, the school's population, and other little tidbits that you can use. Um, usually the district webpage has all the tools necessary for you to do your own research, but um, it's just important for you to know where you're at at all times because 
at, you know, teaching the kid a new strategy and new coping skills may be, you know, why don't you go take a walk down the park down from where you're at? Or why don't you go here? This is, you know, this is a local boxing gym. Maybe you can join boxing. Um, those are, those are good uh, techniques for the kids to learn. And it's very important for you to know where you're at so you can be able to guide them to those. Um, so what I did whenever I was there was I kind of researched on some of my schools. I know I researched Taft when I first got there. I even researched Greystone when I was the first BHA there. Um, and one of these things is when you research your schools, use it as information for you to have. Don't judge it. Don't criticize it because, you know, as, as we're seeing here, Bodine, Bodine doesn't have the prettiest scores as a school, but you're there to help and be able to help guide these kids. Maybe you'll have an impact on some of these things. Um, you know, so what I have here is, uh, let's see here. So like I said, the link that I provided on the, on the slides was for the OKCPS district, and it tells me all the departments they have. It's also good to know the departments of your local school district so you can be able to help the families and guide them to where they need to be, such as OKCPS has a uh, language and cultural center that allows parents to get information in their native language. Um, so that's another strategy there too as well, is being able to inform the parents. Because, um, you know, you only spend time, you know, with these kiddos maybe 45 minutes, an hour or two with them, but they go home. And if their parents are not well aware of what's going on at school or how to be able to or they don't know about their rights, that may be something that you may need to educate them on. Uh, that way they can be able to uh, function in their school. So, as I said, there's Bodine. Bodine, like I said, is not, has, does not have the best grades, but the thing is, like I said, we're there to help and be able to provide that safety and security. Um, so, on to the fun things, the uh, tools that I have here. A little bit going back about knowing your environment. Google, Map, Google Maps is a big help. Uh, Googling everything, seeing what's going there, what's here, what's what's by, you know, what's local. Um, to be able to know, like I said, to know your environment. Remember, we go there. Some of us do live in the environment, but some of us go there, work, and then go home, back to wherever we're from. Um, our kids literally go there, get bused, and or they may walk home, and they're like maybe within a mile from the school. So they live in these environments. And just for you to know their environment as well helps you build that rapport, and that way that kid can be able to be credible with you. Because um, uh, knowing their environment and their daily struggles is something big. and That's how you connect with the kids. So going on to these apps. So these apps are huge. Talking about, like I said earlier from the presentation with social media and technology, these kids are very tech savvy. I mean, a five-year-old can operate an iPhone and probably send Snapchats and, you know, set up their own Instagram page. It's amazing what these kids can do now with technology. So a lot of these kids already have cell phones. Um, one thing is for you to be able to, you know, maybe download some of these on your work phone or on your phone and for you to be able to take a look and see which one you feel that can function with these kids. So I have listed, I think, seven, seven or eight of these apps and if you're going to download all of these I would advise you to create a uh, an alternate email so you can send all these emails there or else your email from work is just going to have mood pass sends you this or headspace is checking up on you on here and just you're going to be flooded with emails so I would say set up an alternate email if you're going to test all these out because they're all going to want you to create accounts and they're going to send you emails and whatnot so I'm going to go ahead and kind of tell you a little bit about these. So Calm, uh, this was a good app. Uh, this one did cost, after your free trial, $70 per year. But it does teach calming techniques. It has an extensive library. It just teaches everything there. So if you're willing to use that for 70 bucks, that's cool. Um, I really like the layout of it, and so it was pretty cool. Um, but like I said, there's there's some of those that you can use um, uh, the trial or uh, just limited space in the library for you to use the techniques. 
Headspace. That one was the most costly. That was 95 bucks per year. It does the same as Calm, but it has a bigger library. So that one came with a lot more techniques, a lot more meditation techniques, a lot more just everything. It was just a little bit. It was bigger than Calm. Mood Path. Mood Path. This app tracks your mood over a week. It didn't charge me anything, but it does have a premium library with payment. Uh, this this can help a kiddo journal their mood and see what days and how mood they went they were in during the week. So this this trial or this free version um, with ads. So be careful when you click on stuff. Um, it'll help you track. You know, like where's the kid at? Where, where, how do you feel today? And then it'll just kind of generate that path throughout the week and be like, okay, well Monday what happened here? What happened here? And all this. So it, it, it does a pretty good journal. So it's a pretty much an uh, uh, electronic journal uh, that you can help the kid out with. Um, Breathe, this app is free. It just allows the kid to do meditation and give themselves the time to practice mindfulness. I actually have uh, practiced this app with a kiddo. Uh, she was having high anxiety. So this we, we pulled up the app. And we kind of went through it, and it guided her through a meditation because what it does is it checked in and says, how stressed do you feel on zero to five, uh, five? Um, blah, blah, blah. It asks all these different questions, and then it asks, okay, what I'm suggesting is that you take a five-minute breather or a meditation. So we went through the meditation, we talked through it, and then she was finally relaxed, and she was able to go back to class. Uh, so that one I do have on my phone, and I also encourage her to be able to download it on there. Um, you know, one thing that you can tell these kids is like, you know, you got time enough to check on Facebook and put up statuses and like photos and whatnot, but how many times do you kind of check in on yourself and give yourself a like? And so they're like, mm, never. So, you know, trying to help them get into using helpful apps instead of <laughs> – getting on social media and all this other stuff. Uh, here's some other ones. Uh, I'll kind of touch over these real quickly. Pacifica, this also tracks mood, but can help up, it can help set up notifications to check up on you and your mood. Also, have, also has health suggestions such as like taking a walk or healthy decision. Uh, this app was also good. Instead, it said, okay, you can either meditate for five minutes or you can go on a run for 10 minutes. So it offers that. Uh, super better makes work with kids a lot better. It has challenges. Uh, so if you're working with elementary kids, it has these challenges like chug a glass of water or hug yourself. And what's called this challenge was human tag, improving your social contact. You know, say hi to somebody that you don't know or, you know, smile at somebody, smile at your teacher. It also has an option to battle a bad guy. So, for example, the self-critic. And if you choose to battle this bad guy, it's, it's just pretty much – giving yourself a compliment, helping increase your self-compassion. Tell yourself you're trying your best. As well as another bad guy is liquid calories to pretty much avoid sweet drinks. It says, okay, you're going to battle this guy. Try to drink as much water as you can. Stay away from sugar. And then Seven Cups uh, is a group chat room. It offers support via support bot other, and other users in a group texting forum and a real therapist if needed. This is good for those textures that you know. Um, that one was pretty cool. It, it, it just, it just kind of helps you out, engages you into all, you know, just allowing you to kind of group talk. And then the last one, Talkspace, matches you with a therapist and gives you therapy just like in the office uh, per text messages and uh, also through telecommunications. So they did have a little intake process and then a treatment plan as far as I could get into. Uh, I didn't know if they billed or what the details after that was. But those are some apps that can hopefully help you in the schools, uh, help you teach these kids some new strategies. And, you know, for these apps, hopefully they download them and continue with them and they see that it's useful for them. So, um, again, that's my time. And so um, I hope you all hope y'all learned a lot. Thank yeah, you. Benji, thank you so very much. Um, for all of the information and the resources, let me, I'm going to, uh, 